And so what QSPS does now, if you have purchased that after September of 2010, is you can get a 100% tax exclusion on the sale of your qualified small business stock up to $10 million in capital gains or 10 times the basis in the stock that you invested at. On today's show, we have Brett Calhoun. We'll discuss everything you need to know about investing in tech at an early stage to achieve tax breaks that spur innovation and leave you with no federal tax bill. Tune in to the end to see if your investments will qualify for a 0% tax bill. Brett, let's start by letting us know and give us insights to what QSBS is and what it stands for. Hey, Joe. Thanks for having me on the show and really excited to talk about QSBS, which on the surface might seem like a very boring topic. But in the end, this is actually very exciting and what all investors or anybody in the cap table should be paying attention to. So QSBS, Qualified Small Business Stock, what is that? QSBS is a government tax incentive to spur innovation to investing in early stage technology, high growth startups. And so what QSBS does now, if you have purchased that after September of 2010, is you can get a 100% tax exclusion on the sale of your qualified small business stock up to $10 million in capital gains or 10 times the basis in the stock that you invested at. And prior to that, there was different rules where if it was before 2010, it was a 75% or 50%. But the gist of it, what's relevant now is it's 100% tax excluding. Well, that's very interesting. So what was attractive to QSBS that kind of led you down the rabbit hole to learn more about it and maybe something about your background that kind of led you there too? Yeah. So my background, accounting, finance, CPA, I did a lot of valuation work for small businesses to Fortune 100 companies starting out early in my career. And when you look at like sell side M and A in the traditional business, it's not something that's really focused upon. But then it was like something very valuable that I could bring up as a valuation expert. Hey, you're selling your business. You should actually look at QSBS because you might be able to save millions on this sale. How I got into it is when I was working at the Legal Tech Fund, and the managing partner there had all these issues with Section 1045 rollovers. So now that's in a whole other can of worms beyond 1202. If you sell 1202 early before the five-year period, you can actually roll that stock into other qualified small business stock and continue that timeline and it maintains everything it had before that time period of selling it. So all these issues with Section 1045, and what really drew me to it was the fact that you can get creative with transactions and dump that money into different, into different startups and then really maximize your, your tax gains. And so I, when I was at the legal tech fund, I just went down these rabbit holes for the managing partner, trying to understand how can I help him solve his tax problems? And for somebody that's extremely sophisticated in this area, um, and he was having issues with it, it was like, oh my, and oh my gosh moment, like there's probably all these employees, investors, angel investors, people who do understand the tax code and are very sophisticated when it comes to transactions, but have no idea how to use QSBS. And then further going down that rabbit hole is just, there's only like a handful of attorneys across the US that are actually experts on this. And for someone who is like an employee trying to make sure that their stock qualifies, you're gonna end up paying one to $2,000 an hour to these attorneys and you might even have to pay 50 grand for an opinions letter. So how can we make this government tax incentive that is supposed to be used, that isn't being used, more attainable for anybody on the cap table. So let's get started by, for those that are tuning in here, and obviously they all wanna first know is, what are the qualifications, right? And what type of entities, let's start with, qualify under this tax break? Yep, so C-Corps are the entities that qualify, domestic C-Corps in the US, but most startups actually start out as LLCs, as you may know. If you're an LLC taxed as a C-Corp, your QSBS timeline does start at that date. Before selling your LLC, you'll have to convert to a C-Corp, but the five-year timeline did qualify. Now, if you were an LLC prior, not taxed as a C-Corp, you can still convert the entity to a C-Corp. And then when the conversion happens, however you do that conversion, is when the QSBS timeline starts. Now, something interesting about this conversion, and we've worked with many startups on is Let's say LLC was formed in 2015, and then a year later, they raised $500,000 at a, let's say, $5 million valuation. And then 
they go to raise some institutional money from VCs, and the VCs obviously want a C corp because of various reasons, like an LLC doesn't have preferred stock, it has members units. So then they convert from this LLC that was worth five million to a C corp. Okay. Now at the time of conversion, the, the company could have been worth five million or ten million, whatever. But what happens is, is those founders' stock. So let's say they still own ninety percent of the business, and it was worth five million. Their stock is now worth four and a half million. What is interesting about QSBS is it is the exclusion is the greater of 10 million or 10 times your basis on the stock. And so in some cases, it can be beneficial to start out as an LLC, not a C Corp, because when you convert it to a C Corp, let's say your stock is worth $5 million. Now your QSBS exclusion is 10 times that, 50 million in gains that you could possibly exclude upon the sale of your company. So you mentioned 10x or 10 million, right? And that's from a investment dollar standpoint, how much is invested? So when you think of the value of the stock upon conversion, it can either be the amount that was invested by a VC fund. So let's say the company is still a qualified small business and the VC invests $2 million in this company. Or let's just say an angel investor invests $2 million in this company because typically, if you think of a VC there's LPs in the fund. And so each LP has their own 10 million exclusion. So if a VC invested $2 million, it wouldn't be necessarily one entity investing 2 million. That 2 million is split across say 50 LPs and each of those LPs have their 10 million gain. So let's say one individual invests $2 million in a company. So 10 times that his gain would be 20 million, not 10 million. Got it. Now, for those that might be thinking of utilizing if they have a husband or wife or siblings or kids, maybe multiple trusts, is there any benefits as an investor in a certain round to have multiple parties invest and they each get the tax break separately? Yes, there is. It does not work with a husband and wife. They're considered as basically one entity when it comes to the QSBS game. Now, let's say that you're a founder of a company, you're looking at probably getting a $50 million gain and you can only exclude 10. But you have four kids. We can set up four trusts and gift each of those trusts that QSBS stock. And each of those kids will also get a $10 million gain. And so at the end of the day, your $50 million in QSBS gains is completely excluded from taxes. So roughly saving around you know, $15 million in taxes. And in that scenario, is, there, is that five-year holding period, would that start on the day it kind of gets moved into that trust? Or would it all start from the original issue date? original issue date, if stock is gifted, that gifted stock remains with the original issue date from the gifter to the giftee. Got it. All right. Well, let's also, let's hit on what industries obviously qualify, right? So can you kind of go into that? Yeah. So I would think of it more, not necessarily on an industry basis, but how the company conducts or builds its product or services. Because if it is a service-based company, so think of like a restaurant or like an engineering form or a CPA where you're relying on like a CPA license or the certain skill of an employee, or it's not necessarily, you're not necessarily selling a product. It's more of this service-based. That really typically doesn't qualify for QSBS because they're looking for technology-based businesses that are innovative and providing products to consumers. Now, if you think of an industry that doesn't qualify, so let's think like a financial services company. So financial services doesn't qualify for QSBS because it is a service. You're just handing out cash to people. Now, if you add in technology to that component, it can be argued that the true value of this business is the technology. There's recent case law showing that some of these companies do qualify. So whether it's an argument, is, is this an insurance brokerage? Well, it might be an insurance brokerage, but they're conducting their services in a certain way because of the technology they built. And that is the real IP of the company. And so it is to the extent where it comes into value having somebody who's an expert in QSBS who can say, hey, no, this company, yes, it shows this industry and the tax code, but they're conducting their business through technology. And this is exactly what QSBS was for. And so it really comes down to being able to articulate a story 
that the way the company has been built and the way that they're delivering value to consumers is in a very innovative technology and QSBS friendly way. So basically, we, it's safe to assume that almost all technology related startups would qualify from you know, the original issue date. And does it have to be a certain valuation that has to be under? Yes. So it's not necessarily the value. So it's not the valuation of the company. It is the aggregate gross assets on the balance sheet. So not the enterprise value, not the value of assets minus liabilities, not the equities, the aggregate gross assets on the tax return at any given point cannot be above $50 million. So if you took out a loan for 50 million and you had another million dollars in assets, so you've got 50 million in cash and you got a million dollars in vehicles, your company no longer qualifies on that date and any other date in the future. So at the point where your business goes above 50 million, if it, let's say the next year goes down to 25, you can, know, you can no longer issue QSBS from that point on. Now, let's say a company raises $20 million at a $100 million valuation. That does not disqualify the company. That valuation that was put on them is not the aggregate gross assets, but is a fair market value of the equity. Got it. So mostly through, depending on obviously the aggregate gross assets, but even A round or possibly B round still may qualify under this tax break. Exactly. And I could definitely say that probably most people are not aware of that, right? Most people are not aware of this. When people read the tax code, they usually interpret this as whatever the value of the company is. And that's just not the case. I've heard that and seen that. So also, how would this Section 1202 apply to the manufacturing sector? It does not mention manufacturing in QSBS. And so if you're a manufacturing company, you are building products. And as long as you're not above 50 million in assets, I would assume that you're a qualifying business. And then as long as your assets are being used towards that qualifying business, then it should qualify. Is there any other rules that may apply that we haven't been covering? So one rule that we haven't covered is the active trader business test. And so to be an active trader business, there is more than just being like a qualifying industry. When you look at the active trader business requirement, you have to meet this for substantially all of the time that you have held the stock. And so substantially all is this ambiguous term that the tax code uses, just like about every single line in the tax code is very ambiguous and almost up for self-interpretation. And so let's think like 80% of the time you have to be an active trader business. Starting that is, so say most startups probably won't even have revenue for a year or two. Now, there is a period in the tax code that allow you to have two years as like this R&D phase where you don't necessarily have to have revenue. And then you can also, from this time period, have working capital that is excessive. So this is another test that you have to understand is, do I just have cash sitting on my balance sheet that's not being used? We have no revenue. For two years, there's a grace period that's just R&D. You're not really producing revenue, selling products. It's not really a qualified small business, but they understand that you're building your company, getting ready to go to market. Now, once that has been done, you have to prove that the money you've raised and the cash sitting on your balance sheet or the vehicles or buildings that you're using are being used towards carrying out this qualified trader business. And so that is another test that a lot of people do not remember. And this is where it comes into play that people on the cap table can't really prove that it's a qualified small business because they can't get the data to prove that it was an active trader business for substantially all the time period that they held the stock. And so that's when it comes down to having someone who is an attorney or a QSBS expert to come in and analyze that for you and try to work with the company to get the data to prove that it is a qualified small business. Now, when you get an expert to kind of come in, I, from my own opinion that, you know, sometimes that can be costly. Is there anything that can be done to expedite that and make it affordable so everybody is well informed of what the tax breaks are when they're in an investment? Yep. So the company that I was on the founding team of, Cap Gains and QSBS Expert, what they're doing is automating the QSBS analysis reports on a company level. So instead of you know, paying $50,000 for a tax opinion, this is more of like 
a fact gathering report where we take all of the data from the company from the date of incorporation and put that through these extensive tests and show, hey, there was no like red flags. There's no reason to think this wasn't QSBS because of one, two, three, four, five, and six. So what the team has done there has leveraged like AIML to go through and read tax returns to interpret different data points and then spit this out into an automated report, which cuts the cost by magnitudes. So it's going to cost you, you know, 10, 20 times less than it would to go to a tax attorney. And what you can do with this report is take it to your CPA and say, hey, I know that you don't feel comfortable with me claiming the QSBS, but now I have this report that shows that there is nothing on a company level displaying that this doesn't qualify. And then secondly, what the team does is analyzes when you got your stock and make sure that the timeline investing schedule of that stock meets QSBS requirements. Got it. Let's go into more detail about, you mentioned if the stock is not held for the five-year required timeframe for the tax exemption, what happens and what are the options you can do? Yep, so if it is not held for the five-year period, so let's say the stock is sold in three years, you have two years left, you have 60 days to decide if you want to roll that money over into another QSBS entity, which is a very strict timeline. It's hard to do for sure. That's another problem that the cap gains team is trying to solve is creating opportunities to instantly invest in with companies that have already had diligence done on them. That's another product TBD on <laughs> off day, but that is definitely an opportunity a lot of people would love to just roll their money over into like a save for like a convertible note, but those do not qualify until the date of conversion because it's not technically stock yet. It's still a debt-like um, vehicle. Another thing that people have tried to do is roll that money into a business they've incorporated on their own, but that turns into this tight rope of, you know, you have to spend that money somehow. Do you pay yourself a salary? Is it actually going to be saving you that much money to roll it over into a company that you started your own? And just that one gets very muddy in, in trying to tell the IRS that this is a QSBS entity. So my suggestion would be to roll that over into a couple different QSBS companies, which is allowed. So let's say that you have a $5 million gain you could roll that over into five different startups and each of those startups would have their own $10 million exclusion. Got it. But I'm sure that's probably hard to execute in a timely fashion and probably typically doesn't work out. So the best way and hopefully is the least hold at five years, right? Exactly. And so when it comes to the actual tax breaks, breakdown, we said a 0% on the federal level. Is there anything to look at from the state level and are some states different? Yeah. So... 43 of 50 states will comply with the QSBS regulations or either comply or the state doesn't have capital gains tax. But there are a few states that do not allow QSBS. And one of those being California, which has the highest state income tax in the country. And there is a few like uh, New Jersey who have their own QSBS regulation where it has to be like a New Jersey company or you have to have X number of employees in New Jersey. There's a few states like that, but for the most part, over 43 states allow QSBS and that can be found on the QSBS expert website. And it goes in detail each state and why they're different. That's awesome. And recently I heard some conversation, obviously with the government tax proposals to maybe change these rules in the last couple of months. Do you see this as a possible impact in the future? And do you have any insights? So that did get pushed into the Build Back Better plan. You know, for me, I, I thought it was quite interesting that, you know, they're looking to spend upwards of two, three billion dollars. Whereas they're saying that if they change the QSBS rules to only people under 400,000 in income could use the 100%, it was going to make a tax impact of roughly a billion dollars, which is well under 1% of the budget they were trying to fix. The cap gains team, QSBS expert team, and CARTA and other folks actually were working with lobbyists and government officials to try to keep that out of the Build Back Better plan. 
And so there was a ton of support for keeping QSBS. And when you think of the importance of QSBS, generally most people, I mean, I don't have the data to show this, but from what I understand and the people that I've talked to who have been on the cap table of a company and have had a decent exit, generally that money is recycled back into other startups and is invested towards growing our economy and investing in innovative companies. I don't see the government ever actually completely destroying QSBS. And I don't see them cutting it down in the near future as it was already shot down recently, because this is literally our only federal tax incentive to spur innovation right now. And I have an article on why QSBS is important, how much money it can actually save and create for the economy. I think it's interesting too, if you look at like a venture program, so say like Missouri Venture Program, Missouri Technology Corporation, every dollar they invested in a company as a venture program came back as roughly $3 in tax for the Missouri economy. Now it's the same thing with QSBS. When that QSBS dollar isn't taxed and it's reinvested in another company who creates jobs and sells products, has sales tax, payroll taxes, creates much more tax revenue on top line revenue for federal and state governments than taking capital gains tax on QSBS dollars. And so if this is continued to be proven, I don't think QSBS will ever be completely destroyed. It kind of reminds me a little bit of like the Elon story lately, right? Where they're talking about him selling his stock, but ultimately he's growing this massive company that has all these jobs for everybody and creating manufacturing plants. And the, the product of him scaling that company is a lot greater impact than just paying a tax bill. Exactly. And another thing on that too is, although, you know, everyone says basically like 90% of the money is in like the top 1%'s hands, but it kind of comes down to, you know, who do you trust that money more? Is it either the government or is it these individuals? And for the most part, what I've seen like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, who have been huge supporters of massive charities and reinvesting in innovation across the world, it's hard to argue that you would want to take a lot of that money out of their hands that they couldn't reinvest or be incentivized to invest in charities, which does trickle down to others throughout the economy. I agree. Charity is important. Yep. What is the best way for people to get a hold of you or QSBS expert or learn more about the tax incentives? Yeah. So the, the best way to get a hold of me is to just email me at brett at capgains.com or just come on the website and fill out the contact us form and it'll kind of walk through a few questions. You know, what is your company? What is your tax situation? Are you an employee? Are you a founder? And that just kind of gives us some insights before scheduling time so we know where to take the conversation. Well, I appreciate for uh, joining us today and telling us about this great tax incentives. Thanks a lot, Joe. It's always fun to talk about taxes and QSBS and saving millions of dollars. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching my latest interview. If you like what you saw, please click the subscribe button below to become a member of the Joe Robert community. Be sure to hit the bell to turn on all notifications so you always know when I post a new video. Tell me what you thought about the content in the comments below. I always read them and would love to answer any of your questions.